Hey, I got part two of season one of The Eminence in Shadow here to please your peepers. Check out my previous video if you missed it. Anyway, this guy is slain by a Shadow Garden impersonator in the mean streets. The next day, Sid is harassed for breaking up with Princess Alexia and convinced to visit a new place in town that has babes who sell chocolate. Meanwhile, Iris and the pink nerd, Sherry Barnett, discuss the research of this thing, which showed up in a cult of Diablo's hideout. Sherry is tasked with trying to figure out what even the heck it is, and is inspired by her father, the vice principal, Lutheran Barnett. Iris takes this moment to introduce her new order, the Crimson Knights. Alexia is interested in the strange demonic Dongus as well. Later, the plebs have to wait in line to visit the chocolate shop and discuss the mystery killings. Sid is pulled out of line by an employee and taken indoors. It's a modern mall, owned by his badass ladies, specifically Gamma, who simply made use of Sid's otherworldly wisdom of the shadows. He is shocked by her intellect. Gamma has a very low dexterity level though. He basks in the extravagant glory bestowed upon him by his devout followers, rewarding Gamma in the good with a purple rain. She proceeds to roll in literally a billion dollars, almost incapacitating Sid with her fat stack. Gemma continues on to report that the Capitol's killer, operating in the name of Shadow Garden, is under investigation currently. Sid gets the wrong idea of the murderer's identity, implying he knows who they are, and vowing to look into the case. Goomba is impressed with his omnipotence and introduces a new member, Nu, who offers her services to Sid, after which he yoinks some of that cash with his goop before before running home to beat curfew. The sounds of battle call Sid into action, causing him to feign a horrendously tragic bout of incontinence. He begs to be left behind, citing the need to preserve his honor. The sacred bond of friendship compels Skell and Poe to vow they'll never snitch, and with tears in their eyes and sorrow in their hearts, they part ways. At the battle site, it's Alexia who is fighting a local schizophrenic. His delusional meatbags show up to tag team. Bad news bears for the princess. Shadow has her back with a clutch save. Alexander Alexander tries to ask a million questions, but is blue-balled right before passing out from blood loss. Shadow easily catches his prey, but New steals his quarry. New likes to play with her food, I guess. Somewhere in the woods, a robot and a cheeky hothead reveal that they're behind the killings and after Sherry's artifact. Meanwhile, Alexia reports her findings to Ibis. They still don't know Jack Diddley. The next day, Sid and his loyal companions, who totally didn't rat him out at all, begin operation Ask Hot Girls Out Using Chocolate. Scale fails pathetically, and might have actually died. Poe made sure to do his research, but despite knowing her exact bust size, also fails. Sid blindly gives his chocolate love package to a random woman, who just happens to be Sherry. Later, her father discusses his young love, instructing her to get out of the house from time to time. He's got mad tuberculosis, probably, and the two have a major heart-to-heart -heart moment in front of the foreboding demon doohickey. Ah, uh, the riveting power of being in love. She sensually partakes of the chocolate. Later, at school, New informs Shadow that their captive was brainwashed, a trait of the cult of Diablos' vanguard, the third children. Sid zones out by recalling that Skell and Poe signed him up for the Bushin festival, being unable to enter themselves due to their injuries. New continues to explain to a vacant Sid that a cultist named Rex is currently in the capital. Sid doesn't listen at all, and eventually just gets up and leaves after muttering something vague, which New interprets as his omnipotent processing instead of esoteric gibberish. She then proceeds to have a gruesome flashback to when she became a meatball. Sometime later, at the bus in festivities, Claire kills this guy in swordplay, Scal and Poe lose their life savings on a single bet, and Sid gets paired up to duel with a main character called Princess Rose Oriana. He finds the opportunity to be pathetic in the most spectacular way by unveiling his special move, spinning drill fall, bloody tornado. Sid insists that he still fight, despite vomiting blood. He continues to impress the princess with his unyielding tenacity. The referee intervenes to end the match, believing that Sid will likely be killed should they continue. Rose recites poetry to herself in light of her Pyrrhic victory as Sid is hoisted away. After the event, the mummified Sid is accosted by Pinko the nerd, who has been passively rizzled. I don't know how he's slurping his juice through those wrappings. She gives him a sack. Sid is confused. The friendship initiation was a success, and her father is proud. Sid reflects on the mistake 
mistake of getting involved with such prolific characters and decides that he should just lay low for a while. Later, Sherry is infatuated. She decides that since Alexia knows Sid, she should make contact. Cheryl nervously asks the princess about her relationship with him, accidentally causing the unfortunate demise of this perfectly good teacup. Back in school, it's student council election time, causing some of the main characters to narratively congeal. Somewhere in the basement, the robot makes a bubble with his teeny orb, trapping the entire school with an anti-magic barrier. No one but Sid noticed, though. It's the Shadow Garden wieners who have decided to take over the academy. They picked the wrong classroom to harass. Oh. Never mind. The knights have no magic. That's probably not too good. Sid heroically takes the fall to protect Princess Rose from the assassin. Sid is elated by the opportunity to be the first to die in a domestic terrorism incident. Rose scolds him for his courage, gently holding his head like that of a dove with clipped wings. Sid's heroic sacrifice allowed the rest of the classroom to be evacuated to the auditorium without further bloodshed. Even without magic in the air, Sid resuscitates himself with whatever scant traces were around. By unleashing his special move, 10 minute death, heartbreak. He quickly deduces the narrative and gets going to continue it. Meanwhile, Sherry is attacked by the named cultist, Rex. Wolverine of the Crimson Knights intervenes, inciting a monologue which buys time for charcuterie to escape. Sid assesses the situation from the roof, pointing out various cliches while he excitedly contemplates his own place in the drama as the eminence in shadow. The prospect of wearing black in the daytime is atrocious, so Sid entertains himself by sniping the bad guys in the meantime. His game is interrupted by Sherry's pathetic attempts at stealth. With everything else sorted out, all that's left to do is jump off a building and follow Sherry around. While skittering through the hallways, she deduces that the enemy has the other half of the artifact and decides to find more information in her father's room. Sid is eventually forced to emerge from hiding to scold Sherry on her lack of wariness. Later, in the vice principal's room, Sherry finds scripts detailing an object called the Eye of Avarice, which absorbs specific magical frequencies. When reaching capacity, it can unleash all the whiz-biz sword within into a massive explosion. However, the artifact in Sherry's possession can stabilize the eye, allowing it to simply become a storage device for magic. She plans to sneak through the hidden tunnels into the auditorium and somehow attach the eye and the artifact together. Rex and the robot discuss the location of the artifact and the presence of a master who is whacking all their dudes. The robot's impetus is to be reinstated as a knight of rounds, apparently. Rex is ambushed by a shadow in the hallways, causing him to Shadow touches his face, though. Rex is launched into a room filled with the corpses of his associates before being eviscerated, presumably. Meanwhile, New aggressively mourns the fallen Crimson Knights, reflecting on how, in her past, she was betrothed to the blue-haired fella. While Sid fumbles around with some science stuff, she reports that Shadow Garden is waiting to act with Gamma in command. The presence of the anti-wizard ball has made infiltration difficult, but there is no movement from the cult as of yet. Sid requests some help identifying a few things, informs New about the artifact, then states casually as he leaves that the barrier will be down by nightfall. With the pawns in position, all that remains is for Sherry to finish her thesis. New makes signals while Rose contemplates their chances of survival. Sherry tickles a lemon juicer with her metal rod, exciting the green board and obtaining admin privileges to the artifact. She reflects on the brutal murder of her mother and her adoption by the vice principal afterwards. Sid gives her words of encouragement and they part ways. Meanwhile, the robot has tuberculosis and the students are in dire straits. Rose ideates furiously but finds no solution. Sherry heroically tosses the powered up artifact at the robot, disabling the anti-wizard seal. The knights are released and immediately engage in violence. Rose realizes that the battle will be short-lived with how little magic they now possess, finding courage through her admiration for Sid to keep dismembering people. Shadow detects the most stylish way to enter, stunning Rose with his one liners and skill. He introduces himself and his women as Shadow Garden and initiates the skirmish between associations. Rose begins to evacuate everyone, while the robot goes to incinerate the entire school with his dastardly gas. It's handy that Shadow is fire resistant. The knights have begun to tend to the students and receive a full report from Rose. Gamma and the girls peace out after collecting all the artifacts, leaving Shadow to clean up. Sid reveals himself to the vice principal, questioning him about his motives. Lutheran monologues about a 
achieving absolute glory as the Bruxin champion, then being laid low by his tuberculosis, causing him to seek out an artifact to maintain power. He hired Sherry's mother to figure out how to use the Eye of Avarice, but she didn't want to tell him because it was too dangerous. Luther psychotically disemboweled her right in front of Sherry. Big Jax. Sid responds by rhetorically questioning whether he used Sherry for his selfish gain. Luther gives him a glaring yes, then asks if that angers him. Sid doesn't know the answer, but states how he's very particular about what things and people he finds significant. I think this is Sid contemplating whether he's a psychopath or not. Sid freaking dies for real. Shadow has appeared all of a sudden, ready to engage. The VP understands when he's outmatched and immediately activates his magical girl powers, metamorphosing into a veiny alien. He darts around, disappointing Shadow with the shallow quakes of his sword. Luger roids out so hard on the magic orb that his eyeballs start trying to escape into his hairline. Shadow is unimpressed. Luther threatens Shadow Garden with pathetic statements about turning the world against him. Shadow doesn't care because his organization will always tread their own own path, unbound by what the plebs deem socio-culturally acceptable. Luther is given the same treatment that Sherry's mother received, as penance for his manslaughter, taking the short bus to hell on wooden wheels. Oops, that's a bit more trauma to add to the heaping pile. Sherry is probably not going to be okay for a while. That rhymed. Shadow flies off into the distance as Sherald's cries haunt the night sky. Later, Alpha reflects on Shadow's massive bounty for mass murder, kidnapping, arson, and robbery, finding it to be just as he said, that he will accept the guilt for all crimes, but it won't change anything. The school is pretty jacked up. Sherry thanks Sid for the help he gave during the battle, informing him that she will be heading to Logus to keep doing cool science, leaving her past behind, and explaining that there is something she needs to do. Right before departing, Sid inquires about what that specific something is, she responds by almost breaking out into tears and ambiguously saying, it's a secret. Summer break has begun and most of the students have gone home when an auspicious letter arrives from Alpha mentioning the sacred land of Lindworm. This is a big moment for those pervs out there who enjoy a good crotch shot, by the way. This Miku lookalike turns her goop into body mods in an attempt to turn fate doomed to defeat into victory. Victory over nature, that is. Meanwhile, Beta writes fanfiction about Shadow's accomplishments accomplishments in her underwear. She and Epsilon duel. We are metaphysically transfigured into a cat temporarily as the two quarrel. It is enjoyable. Sometime later, the royals prepare for a trip to see the Pope by shopping at Shadow Garden's indoor mall. They are treated to little meatballs and some sexy underwear. Alexia remains absolutely determined to wear a thong to seduce Sid, despite Iris's pleas to consider more reasonable articles of clothing. Sometime in the past, Rose wades through swathes of students who were injured in the terrorist attack, desperately searching for Sid. Upon finding him, she immediately confesses her devout love. Back in the present, in spite of his best attempts at remaining a background character, Sid is on his way to his new girlfriend's country via train. Rose is suffocating. Sid reflects on how he and her just happened to be going to the same place, and that Alpha's instruction to head to the sacred land must have something to do with the goddess's trial. What in the Yisekai voodoo is that sci-fi circle doing out there? Anyway, those who overcome the goddess his trial, are granted the title of hero, and are considered royalty, thus Princess Rose's excitement about Sid entering said trial. He decides that Rose probably just wants to proselytize him, and sleeps on the ceiling to evade her advances. Later, at Lindworm, Rose informs Sid about their religion's deep lore. A hero named Olivier lopped off the left arm of Diablos a while ago, sealing it underground somewhere near the city. Rose excitedly visits Beta's bookstore, as Sid reflects on the blatant plagiarism from stories of his old world from the book signing, Sid is given a coded message detailing the mission that he regrettably can't read. Meanwhile, Alpha recites poetry over the corpse of a prominent figure of the church while trying to figure out who killed him. Sid just happens to spot a suspicious rooftop assassin while posing cinematically on a building, following him into an alleyway and stumbling upon Epsilon in the process. She breasts boobily while reporting on the proceedings of the mission. Sid appreciates the details Epsilon puts into patting her chest. And that's the end of part two of season one of The Eminence in Shadow. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed rubbing your eyes on this video, mayhaps consider a like or a subscribe, maybe even a Patreon donation, but no pressure, homie. Huge thanks to those who have already signed up. Um, thanks again. Bye.